Okay, so we are recording now. We can begin. And uh, the school is very keen on exams. So first of all, let's just begin with some housekeeping about the exams. So if you remember from my explanations, I've kept on reminding you that the exam will be divided into two parts. We have what's called the short answer exam, which is a multiple choice exam. And these will take one hour. I hope you have seen from the timetable. Do you know the day it will be done? Anybody? Uh, fifth in the morning. Fifth. Is it fifth or fourth? I'm not very sure. Is it Tuesday? Okay, so you know the exam will be done on Tuesday, uh, the one hour exam. It is basically a one hour and 30 marks. I'll be prepared for that. And this kind of exam is what is called, it's called proctored, meaning you can't check, you are not allowed to check anywhere. So by fourth, you have to make sure you have read, you have revised, you've prepared. Then I've made this very simple. It is just a set of 30 questions, just like you are doing in the cut. A set of 30 questions. Each question carries one max. And uh, then there will be an open book exam. This one is set to a maximum of four hours. This four hour exam, that is an open book exam, also 30 marks. You are allowed to, to check your textbooks. You are allowed to Google on the internet. You can look for the answers anywhere but you make sure you do all that within the four hours. Can somebody remind us when is the date for the open book exam? Uh, Come on, who has seen the timetable? 19th. 20th. Yeah, I think it should be 19th or 20th, and I think it starts in the morning at 8 a.m., right? I'm not sure with that. Yeah, it starts in the morning at 8 a.m on either 19th or 20th. So this is a kind of exam that will require you to do something, but for you to do that something, you are allowed to check and search for the answers anywhere, provided you do that within the four hours. So that's it about the exams. One more thing about the exams is, have you seen the instructions about a special kind of browser called the Responders Browser, which will be used to administer the short answer exam. Have you seen those emails? Yes. Yes, and I hope that you guys have downloaded that responders browser and installed it. Now we are required to do a pilot. So we'll do a pilot uh, quiz. We'll do a pilot quiz, which you can do either tomorrow or Thursday. So you can do on Wednesday, or you can do it on Thursday. When do you think you can do this? Can we set it for Thursday? Yes, sir. Yes. Thursday at what time? Oh. Thursday what time? You guys tell me. Yeah. I want you to tell me. Like this week, Thursday. Yeah, at what time? What time? Five to six. Yeah. Okay, how many of you agree with uh, Thursday 5 to 6? Uh, can it be at 5.30? 5.30 to 6.30? Okay, you, you guys, you guys uh, decide. Among, I don't know how you can decide among yourselves uh, yeah, what is the best time, but it has to be uh, one hour. So one hour, you can even start at seven if you want. Can we do it from seven so that everyone has time? Yeah. Yes. Seven to eight. Mm. Perfect. Then let's do, let's do the pilot exam last day, seven to eight. The reason why I'm writing this here is so that nobody uh, later on complains. 
Now, the way I'm going to set up the pilot quiz, it will be more or less like the cut we did. So you have 10 questions, 10 questions for three topics. Okay. And the three topics I want us to cover are the succeeding topics after the first three. So the last one was on week five, not week five, but four, I think. From four. Uh, so four, five, six. So the cut to cover weeks four to six. Okay. So you'll see just in the same way, I will have a quiz like this. But if you have read the instructions of how to use the responders browser, you will not be able to access the quizzes unless you're using that browser. The moment you open the quiz using that browser, you cannot minimize, you cannot do anything else until you reach the end of the 10 questions. Then you open the next quiz, again, 10 questions. You're not allowed to close the browser. You can't minimize and so on until you finish the 10 questions. So we want to have 30 questions. This is like our second cut, second and final cut. Okay, second and final cut to cover those three weeks. And these will be 30 marks, just like the first one. Okay, is there any question about the exams and how the exam will be done? I, I hope all of you have downloaded the Responders browser. So by this pilot quiz that we'll do on Thursday, uh, between 7 and 8 p.m., from 30 questions, we will use the Responders browser. So if you don't have the Responders browser, you will not be able to do that uh, pilot quiz. And that is exactly the way the short answer exam will be done, this one. You'll have 30 questions, you're not allowed to check anywhere. And then you'll have an open book exam where you are, you are allowed to refer. So unless somebody has got a question, we can leave that aside and talk about uh, today's topics. Any questions about the exam? Yeah, about the open book. I now check yes. the uh, timetable. You're saying what about the open book? Yeah, it's on Thursday 20th, but I'm not seeing a timer. Just saying. Yes, Thursday. it's on Thursday, I think the 20th. You can do that, guys. You can download the timetables. I think I downloaded the timetables and deleted them. So by meaning that that day, you can just, like. Just a second. Let's just confirm. Here are the timetables. Uh, so here's the timetable for the one hour exam. It's on the fifth, I believe. If I can look for 411. Let's just be sure about that so that nobody comes back to complain to us. Okay, you can see here CSC 411 is on the 5th of August. It will be done between 9 and 10 a.m. So I, ho I hope everybody takes note of that. That is the short answer exam on 5th of August. Then the other exam is the open book, the one I'm calling open book exam. You can see there on my computer, the open book exam will be done on the 20th of August. Uh, the time is in the morning from eight to noon. So from eight to noon, that's approximately four hours. That's when the open book exam will be done, okay? Any other question about the exams? I hope you take that note of that very seriously. Don't let alone come and say, I didn't do the exam on time because I'll not be able to set another exam. You know, the process of setting the exam is, the exam must be set. It has to be moderated by another lecturer. It has to be approved and so on. So if you miss it, you have to wait for the next exam cycle. So just take note of those days. It's a fairly uh, straightforward exam compared to the one that you're used to writing a lot over a two and a half hour period. This is just uh, one hour, you answer some 30 questions, multiple choice, true or false. And then four hours, you do an open book exam where you are allowed to refer to the notes, refer to the tutorials I've shown you and so on. So just make sure you take note of that and you're prepared with a computer, with the responders browser, 
And I think on that day, you should make sure you charge your computers, uh, your laptop battery, charge your phone so that in case the internet you're using has a problem, you can quickly reconnect and you continue doing it. Okay? So unless anybody else has got a question on the exam, Um, Somebody, uh, Cynthia is asking, will the pilot exam be graded? The answer is yes. It is our second cut. So the pilot crazy. exam will be graded. It is our second cut. After that, we are not going to do any more uh, cuts. Excuse me, sir. Okay. So no questions. No more questions. Yes, I have a question. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you've said that in case it it speak a little uh, bit louder. You've said you've just said that in case the internet goes, you can reconnect. When the internet goes, the will the responders continue running? It doesn't uh low yeah. low, low out. Yes, that's a good question. Eh? So long as your internet does not disappear for too long, if it disappears for, I think up to about five minutes. There's no problem. Once you reconnect, you're able to continue. But if, say, your internet disappears for one hour, I think the rules have been stated that if you disappear for too long, then you are not allowed to uh, reconnect and continue. Just think about it like the normal exam that you normally do. You are allowed to leave the exam room, maybe go out for a few minutes and come back. But you are not allowed to leave the exam room Go away for one hour and then come back. No, it's so, it's it's because it's it's because uh, our place the internet is usually sometimes it's down or uh, lights usually go off. So in that yeah, case, that's, that's why I'm saying you need to make some arrangements. If you're using a, a a laptop, you have to make sure it is charged. Uh, if you're using an internet somewhere, you should also make sure you have some bundles on your phone just in case the internet that you're using uh, fails. But of course, it's not the end of the world. In case everything fails, there's no power, there's no internet, you can always feel the incomplete form and do the exam the next time it is on offer. <laughs> so we anticipate all those kinds of problems and there'll be a little bit of room to allow for you to reconnect and continue reasonable amount of time but if you disappear from the exam for too long we can assume maybe you have gone to consult or something like that and you may not be allowed to reconnect and continue so short periodic interruptions of internet power and so on no problem you can reconnect and finish okay you can continue to ask more questions about the exams i think you have two weeks this week and next week and I think your student leaders will be meeting the university administration to clarify some of those issues, like what happens if my internet goes down for two hours and so on. And you'll hear what rules the university has set. Okay. So just make sure you have a, a laptop, it is charged. You have a phone in case the internet you're using goes down or something like that. And you can test it before the exam day. Uh, that is only a problem for the short answer exam, the one that you have to do within one hour. The other one, the open book exam, uh, what happens is nobody's monitoring. You connect, you download the question, okay? Then you can go offline and do the question. As long as within the four hours, you reconnect to, to Inas and submit your answer before the four hours are over. So the open book exam, no, not a big problem because you can do it offline and submit later. Okay, so let's just uh, wrap up the last two topics. I don't know what you guys prefer. You prefer that we conclude today or we conclude next week? What do you guys prefer? Should we finish today or finish next week with uh, a little bit of time to, to, to revise and ask some questions? Anybody? Do you prefer that we finish today or we finish next week? Uh, Munyingi says next week. And because nobody has said anything else, 
we'll say let us finish next week okay and that's also good so that we can spread the content and have a little time for question and answer next week so let's just uh, sum up the last two topics uh, actually second last two topics uh, so you have the topic on curves and there's this topic on computer graphic surfaces which I challenged you guys to go and try to read about it uh, last week so I hope you've read and you've tried to do something about the uh, assignments so let's just talk generally about them uh, try and see if I can make it easier for you to understand so I have some simplified very simplified uh, points here that I'm going to use to try and explain these uh, to you guys. So surfaces and curves, they say the last two topics, the last topic is on uh, image processing. So let's talk about uh, surfaces again. I tried to do this last week and this is the explanation I was giving you guys. I was telling you guys it's very easy to display 2D graphics in that you can define them using mathematical shapes. So either you are defining some kind of a polygon, a triangle, a set of lines, a circle, etc. If it's a two-dimensional graphic, that is fairly straightforward to do. But when it comes to three-dimensional graphics, especially if they are complex, okay, you may be challenged in the way you define it. Of course, you may find a few 3D graphics that you can define using a formula, but for a number of them, it is not very easy to define them using a uh, simple formulae. And there are two specific ways that have been uh, determined for representing 3D graphics using 2D definitions. And what we are trying to do here is simply, because we know the formulas of doing very many 2D shapes and polygons, we can use the same shapes and polygons to create a 3D graphic. And there are two ways. There's a boundary representation and space partitioning representations. And uh, this is exactly the kind of thing we are looking at. I don't know if you can see my nice picture, but this picture shows uh, a part of a car that is normally referred to as the fender, the part that goes over the wheels, okay? And you can see this is being designed in three-dimensional uh, uh, graphic. So you can see this is a 3D image because there's some depth and there's some parts of it that are 2D. Now this is exactly the kind of thing that we are saying. We are saying a 3D graphic like this one can be broken down and be described using a set of 2D shapes. And that's exactly what you should be able to see here. You have a 3D image that we want to, to, to display, but we have divided it and broken it down into a set of 2D surfaces, a set of two-dimensional surfaces. And we're saying the reason why we're doing that is because creating 2D surfaces is very easy. These are simple polygons. You can define each of these shapes using some mathematical formula. Either it's a trapezium, a rhombus, a triangle, you can easily define those shapes. And if you can use a set of them to define a 3D graphic, that makes it very easy for you to define your uh, 3D graphic. So we're saying the approach that is used if you are doing your 3D graphic using boundary representation is we define a 3D object using a set or a number of 2D uh, surfaces, okay? Actually, this should be a set of 2D surfaces. That separate the, the object interior from the, from the exterior. What that basically means is we're saying uh, when you are doing this definition of the surfaces, you are doing the definition of the surfaces that cover the 3D object. So it's like you're doing the surfaces for the outer covering or the outside part of the uh, 3D graphic. All those surfaces that are required to enclose the 3D graphic. That's what we mean by separating the interior from the exterior. So you may not be interested in other surfaces, you're only interested in the surfaces that separate 
the interior from the exterior. <laughs> then how do we use, how do we now represent? So if this is your 3D graphic, how do we represent this in the computer as a single graphic? Okay. Now this is where we come up with several different uh, ways of representing these uh, 3D graphics in the computer. So you can use a set of polygons to represent the surfaces. You can use a set of linear equations, which are very easy to remember. Just think again when you look at this 3D graphic, okay? You can define each of these shapes as a polygon, each one of them with its own separate set of vertices and edges, or you can use linear equations. Let's see what we mean by these two different approaches. Uh, so the first way you can represent your 3D uh, graphics, if you're using boundary representations, is you use polygon tables. And I picked this from that tutorial I was trying to show you last week. Now, how do you represent a 3D object using a polygon table? This is an example. What you simply do is the surfaces that you're, we are talking about, you represent those surfaces using vertices or coordinates or points, if you like. So V1 to V5 are the coordinates or the points of vertices. So you have a table that lists all the vertices. And very important to note here is the fact that these vertices are uh, indicated in three dimensions. So each of the vertices has got X, Y, and Z. So V1 has got X, Y, Z coordinates, and so on and so forth. So you create three tables. First table, you have the set of vertices or the coordinates. And the second table called the edge table, you represent the edges, okay? So like E1 is an edge. That edge is defined by the two vertices, V1 and V2. So from the vertices, you can build the edges. So you define the edges using a pair of vertices. Now, to build a complete surface, you use a number of edges. So for example, the surface X1 is made from using the edges E1, E2, and E3. So the edges E1, E2, and E3 define a surface. And remember we are saying that the approach we are taking here is to represent our 3D object using uh, a set of surfaces. So here we have just determined a very simple method, which we are calling the polygon table method. We have three tables. One contains a set of vertices. The next one contains edges that are defined based on those vertices. And the third one contains a set of polygon surfaces. And those polygon surfaces are what we use to define our 3D object. Now that's one approach that you can employ, uh, the polygon table method. There is another way that you can do this. And that is by using the so-called plane equations. So you may have to check out some uh, three-dimensional mathematics and try to understand what is a plane. A plane is like a surface. What we are calling a surface is a plane in three-dimensional uh, arithmetic. And when you're talking about three-dimensional uh, uh, planes, all you need is a set of three equations. In mathematics, some of these are actually referred to as inequalities. Because when you have greater than and less than, we don't call those equations. So. With a set of three inequalities, which are defined here, you can use these inequalities to determine if a given point is on a plane or it's not on the plane. So you notice here that given any point, remember that in a 3D uh, plane or in a 3D coordinate system, every point or every object is defined using three uh, coordinates. You have X, Y, and Z. That's why you can that's what you can see in this equation. If you pick any point, if you pick any point, and you are given the three inequalities that define a given plane by feeding in the values of x, y, and z, you can be able to determine if that point is on that plane or not. Okay, and so we can be able to define surfaces 
by defining the true inequality. I don't know what microphone is that. Kindly turn off your microphone if you are not uh, presenting. I don't know whose microphone is that. Thank you. Okay, so what we're saying here is you can be able to define a plane or what we are otherwise calling a surface in three-dimensional mathematics by using a set of three inequalities. So these inequalities, we define them and solve for the values of A, B, C, and D. If you want to see the methodology of solving those equations, you'll find that here. Okay, so if you want to see the methodology of solving those equations, you will find that methodology here. But basically, the bottom line is, once you solve these three inequalities for a given plane or a given surface, and you have the values of A, B, and C. Now, anytime you are given a point, so whenever you are given a point, and you want to know if that point is on your surface or not, you simply feed it into these three equations. So when you feed it into the three equations, into the first equation, and you get a value that is not equal to zero, then it means that that specific point is not on your surface, okay? And then if you feed it into this inequality and you find that the value you get is less than zero, then it means that the point is inside the surface. And if you feed it into this third inequality again, and you find the value you get is greater than zero, it means that that point is outside the surface. Remember that the approach we're using here is we're trying to create a set of surfaces that enclose a 3D object. That's why you want to know if a point is inside the surface, outside the surface, or on the surface itself, okay? So by using these three inequalities and in some 3D mathematics, you can be able to define a surface or a plane using these inequalities, and you can then be able to determine if a point is on that uh, surface or not. There is a third approach that you can use to do this. That third approach is this one, which is using polygon meshes, okay? Which is using a mesh of polygons. So you have a set of polygons and lines. Remember here, the key thing that is being added is lines. Why is that the case? One of the problems with representing 3D objects using surfaces is you may end up finding a 3D object that is too complex to be defined using a set of surfaces. And I think a good example here would be like uh, the face of a human being. If you look at the face of a human being and try to think, how can you be able to define a set of polygon surfaces that describe the face of a human being. I think it's too complex and it may not be accurately doable. That is why this method here extends so that you are now mixing your surfaces as well as lines. Okay, so you have a set of polygons and lines to approximately represent a 3D object. So this is like, uh, what do you guys think this is? What do you guys think is represented here? Just trying to get your participation so that I don't preach throughout. What do you think is represented in this 3D image? A cup. Uh, yes, I think this looks like a cup on a saucer, okay? And you notice that this 3D image is actually defined using a combination of both polygons. So you can see the divisions. You can use polygons for those. You can use lines for some parts, but the bottom line is you're just trying to do an approximation of the 3D uh, image. Now the advantage of using this approach as compared to the first two, which are strictly based on uh, polygons and surfaces, these can be used to represent many more shapes. So by 
taking advantage, uh, advantage of both polygons and lines, you can actually be able to represent a greater variety of shapes that, than you can do using the first two techniques, okay? So this is a little bit more flexible. And then again, when you look at the fact that you're just using, you're still using polygons and you're still using lines, and we know that those two things are mathematically defined, what does that mean? That again means that in case you want to do transformations, okay, in case you want to do transformations, it is very easy. You can easily do transformations of these kind of uh, 3D objects that are defined using polygon meshes. So for example, if you have this uh, object and you want to make it bigger, that's an example of a transformation. What type of transformation is that that you use to make objects bigger or smaller? Just checking if you're ready for the exam. What type of transformation do you use to make objects bigger or smaller? Scaling. Scaling, very good. So you can either scale up or scale down. And you notice that if you check the video when you are talking about transformations, you can actually define scaling using a transformation matrix, okay? And that transformation matrix will determine how big your object is made or how small the object is made. And I would like to point out that these things are not as, uh, they're not really out of this world. If you look at this image, for example, I can be able to make this image smaller, like that, and I can be able to make this image bigger. So how do you think that is happening? Behind the scenes, in this software called PowerPoint, they have implemented a scaling transformation that enables me to select an image and just by dragging, I can be able to do some transformation. I can actually be able to scale. If you know about uh, a little bit about PowerPoint, you know that you can be able to do quite a number of transformations. You can do reflection, you can do rotation and so on. All those different types of transformations that we've been uh, talking about, you can actually find them within PowerPoint. So using the polygon mesh, is just but another way of representing uh, 3D graphics. So here we are trying to define a 3D graphic using 2D shapes or 2D lines. Okay, so if you notice when we started, we say there are two major approaches that you used to do your uh, 3D graphics, there is boundary representation and space partitioning representation. So how does space partitioning representation work? So remember that the first approach, we're trying to come up with a set of surfaces that enclose the 3D graphic. Now in the second approach, what we are trying to do is we look at the volume or the space that is occupied by the 3D graphic. And then we partition that uh, spatial region into a set of solid. I think this will make it easier for you to understand. So you have that volume of space that is occupied by a 3D graphic, okay? The way this approach represents a 3D graphic is we then break up, we break up that uh, space into a set of contiguous but non-overlapping solids, usually cubes. So here what we mean, uh, you can see here I have two shapes. What do you call this shape at the top? That's the pyramid, right? So when you look at this shape, it looks like a pyramid. But in actual sense, pyramids are made from bricks, if you know. Pyramids are actually constructed using bricks. So what does that mean? That means that this big shape that we're calling the pyramid can actually be represented by using a small set of solids, a small set of cubes. So if you have very many tiny bricks arranged in a certain way, you will end up with this kind of shape. And that's exactly what we are saying is the other way of representing 3D graphics. You look at your 3D graphic, and divide it into a set of 
solid cubes, okay? And when we put all those tiny cubes together, we are actually able to construct your 3D graphic. For the cube down here should be far much more straightforward, but just the pyramid should let you know that, regardless of the fact that this is a, some sort of a triangular shape, if we have very tiny uh, cubes, we can still be able to construct this shape. So we can still be able to define this shape by using a set of uh, solid cubes. And this is another approach for representing uh, 3D graphics. Now let's talk briefly about something else uh, with respect to surfaces. So we have talked uh, mostly about the way we use surfaces, 2D surfaces, to represent 3D graphics. Now you'll find in some books or some tutorials, even including the one that we have been using, we find the tutorials talking about uh, surface detection. So you find something like, you can see here there's a topic on surface detection. And even if you check the textbook that we have been using as the reference, you will find under three-dimensional object representation, uh, you are likely to find some uh, stuff on surface detection. So if you go through this, you'll be able to find here, actually it's right here, surface detection. So what do we mean by surface detection? Just as an extension to the whole topic of computer graphic surfaces. What do we mean by surface detection? Now, in a real uh, graphic, you normally notice that you may have more than one graphic. You may have more than one graphic. And you may be interested in, in determining if you have a set of overlapping opaque graphics, how then do you determine what will be displayed? Because if they are opaque, it means some are hiding behind others and so on. And here we are trying to think about this, not like lay people, but, but, but like the technical people who are required to do this. So if you had a set of shapes, I don't know if I could try to do that. So if I just try to do that here, that's one shape, then I come and do another shape on top of that. So the question there is you have two shapes, one on top of the other. So how do you determine what will be displayed? That's basically the question that is answered by surface detection methods. So how do we know what will be displayed and what will not be displayed? So you'll find that there are three main approaches that have been uh, determined for doing this. And the three main approaches are using a depth buffer. So meaning that as I'm adding the surfaces to my graphic, so that's the first one. So maybe that will be uh, the first graphic. Then when I come and add another graphic on top of it, I use an extra value to indicate the depth so that the triangle, for example, is behind the square. So I can indicate the depth of the triangle to be maybe one and the depth of the square to be zero. And I can create a depth buffer. And by so doing, I can be able to easily determine what is visible and what is not visible. What should be visible is what is at the shallowest depth. And if you go in and read about how the depth buffer method works, is you basically have a representation where we take into consideration uh, depth and we create a buffer, okay? And in that buffer, we indicate the depth of all the objects that are participating in the graphic. And from there, it can be very easy for us to determine uh, what will be displayed and what will not be displayed. Again, there are two other methods that you can use to detect in a case where you have overlapping uh, graphics. There's also the scanline method and there's the area subdivision method, which can also be used to determine what will be displayed when you have a set of overlapping surfaces. And for those two, I invite you to check out here. If you just continue with this, you'll find there's the skyline method, okay? And here, you remember when we were talking about uh, the way displays are able to show information. If you know about the way uh, the old type of CRT televisions used to work, 
where they create images by drawing a certain number of lines on the screen, okay? And those lines on the screen end up representing the resolution. So you can still use those scan lines to determine uh, the depth of the different surfaces and use that to dictate what will be displayed and what will not be displayed. You can read about that here. And there's a third method where you can do some area subdivision so that you're also able to use area subdivision to determine which shape is displayed or not. But the bottom line that we're looking for there is in a scenario where you have a set of graphics that are overlapping like this, how do you determine what is visible and what is not visible? And there are these three techniques uh, for doing that. Now, I'd like us to just briefly uh, talk about, I would like us to just briefly talk about what is in the next topic, which is on curves, so that you can go and expound your reading. So there's this uh, seventh week topic on computer graphics curves. And you must be asking yourself, why do you need to uh, learn about curves? Uh, given the fact that we already know uh, formulas for defining many other different types of shapes, why, need, why do we need to go into uh, curves? Now that takes us back to the example where we are saying, depending on how complex a given image is, it may not be able to very easily define it using a set of polygons and lines. In many cases, you may need to make use of curves. And what we are seeing here is simply many graphics, many graphics have got edges that are not straight. So you cannot use line equations or polygons to define those kinds of graphics. In those kinds of graphics, what may be more useful is if you have a variety of techniques for drawing curves, okay? If you have a variety of different techniques for drawing curves, that may help you to represent certain types of graphics better. That will do a better job than relying on only those uh, uh, edges and shapes that you can define mathematically. So basically there are three different ways of representing curves. And these are the so-called implicit, explicit, and the parametric uh, curve representations. And there's nothing very big in the difference between these three. The only difference is the function. The function that is used by each method to define the curve, okay? So the difference between them is the function. So think of something like the, the line equation. So you have a function that you can use to define the curve, okay? And then you have a few specialized techniques for generating advanced curves. So let's briefly look at these different techniques and see whether we can be able to make sense of them. So very quickly, the first one, uh, the first one, the implicit curve. And this is the simplest type of curve that you, that you represent using some kind of equation, okay? So this represents a function that you can use to determine if a given point is on that curve. So you have some function such as this one, and you can use this to determine the points that are on the curve. Very simple and straightforward. And let's try a slightly more advanced approach. I believe you guys are familiar with these equations. You're familiar with the quadratic equations, things like the sine curve and cosine curves. And those are other examples of curves. Those types of curves are defined using a specific mathematical function. So if you have a quadratic equation like this one here, and you're able to get all the coordinates for that quadratic equation, when you draw and join the coordinates, usually you end up with some kind of curve. Again, you guys are familiar with the sine and cosine curves, okay? These are examples of curves that you can define explicitly using a mathematical function, okay? So the mathematical function explicitly tells you which points are on your curve, okay? As opposed to this previous approach where you have a function that will tell you if a given point is on the curve or not, but cannot tell you the points 
on the curve. So you have those two approaches, implicit and explicit. And then we have another approach of generating curves, the so-called parametric curves. And if you look at this example here, the way the parametric curve approach works is you have two functions, kind of like you have two line functions. So you can see here you have two line functions. And based on those two functions, you can actually be able to produce a curve. So you have two functions, f and g, and based on the way those functions are defined, you can be able to produce a curve. If you want to see the details and the nitty gritties of how the parametric curves work, you can get that here. <clears throat> Let's just have a look. Uh, so there is a parametric curve. You have two you have two functions, and using those two functions, you can actually be able to produce a curve in a way that looks something like this. We have two functions that define those two lines, and based on those two lines, you can actually be able to produce a curve. Now let's look at two slightly advanced approaches that are just building on the same, okay? So if you, if you, if you try to read about this uh, simplified explanation that I put here is, so what is the good thing about the parametric curve compared to explicit and implicit? For example, if you look at the explicit curves, for you to come up with an explicit curve, you must have a function that defines the curve. You must have some equation. If you don't have the equation, you cannot generate the curve. And the equation will tell you where to place the points on the curve. Now, on the other hand here, you can see this is fairly easier. You have a set of two line functions, f and g, and on that basis, you can be able to produce a curve. Let's look at two more slightly advanced approaches and see whether this helps us to understand better. Now we have a slightly more advanced technique of producing curves called the Bezier curves. And the only thing unique about the Bezier curve, like I told you guys, the only difference between all these different approaches is the function, the mathematical function that is used to define the curve. So the Bezier curves use what is called a, Ban a Bernstein function. A Bernstein basis function is what is used to produce Bezier curves. And how does this function work to produce a curve? The way this Bernstein uh, basis function works is you define, you have a function which has got uh, two points, not, not two points, three points. It actually has got three points and it has a variable t that you use to produce a curve. The function also defines what we call a tangent. If you want to read more about it again, uh, the function is right here. If you want to go into the details of how the function works, you can take a look there. But basically, in the simplest terms, you have two functions that define uh, two, two functions that define three points. Like you can see in this, I think the simplest example is this one, the quadratic Bezier curve. So you have three points, and then you have what we are calling a tangent or an angle. And based on those three points, so you have a set of three points and you have a tangent or some angle. Based on those three points and that angle, you can be able to create a curve. And the way that curve is created is the computation of how to draw the curve is using this so-called Bernstein function. So you have three points and you have a tangent or an angle. And based on that, you can actually be able to produce a curve. Now I was trying to look at the OpenGL code for doing this. And I realized there's a bit of code there. But then I also realized that you can actually be able to demonstrate Bezier curves using PowerPoint. So let's see, how can you be able to create a curve 
using a set of three points and a tangent or an angle, or what we are calling a Bezier curve. How can we do the Bezier curve right here within PowerPoint? So within PowerPoint, if you go to the insert menu <clears throat> and go to the shapes, okay? So if you go to insert uh, shapes, you should see here these lines. And one of the lines you can actually be able to insert is a curve like that one. So if I select that curve, then I come here. Just notice what happens. Okay? So you notice that I have a curve that is defined using a set of three points. Here's one point in the middle. And you notice that by altering those uh, points, I can change the kind of curve that I get. Let's look at what I'm doing. I have just three points, a set of three points. And using my set of three points, if I move this around, I can be able to create different curves. I can take it there. I can bring the points a little bit closer. So the curve is narrower. Something like that. And so on and so forth. And you can see here that just by using three points and an angle or what we are calling a tangent, you can actually be able to generate different types of curves. And this is the so-called Bezier curves. So you notice that this kind of curve is not defined using some function. Rather, if you think about it, it is something like this, what we are calling the quadratic curve. So you have like two lines that are joined at an angle. And by playing around with those, the way I'm doing here, you can be able to generate different types of curves. So this is exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about. And we're saying this can be done, this can be done programmatically by the computer. So if you look at the OpenGL functions, you'll find there's an OpenGL function for defining a Bezier curve. So what do you expect those OpenGL functions will be used to do? Obviously the OpenGL functions will be used to define the two lines and define the tangent. And once you've defined the two lines and the tangent, you'll be able to generate a curve. And that's how the uh, Bezier curves method works. So that in a nutshell, we can say it's just using a Bernstein basis function to generate curves by using points and a tangent. I've just shown you here an, an illustration where the curve is being generated using a set of three points and there's some kind of an angle. And by playing around with that, I can generate different curves. And of course here, there is some kind of a function that is defined in the back end and there's a variable. So there's something that I'm changing here when I move this. It can be the angle, I can change the angle, I can change the points, I can change how big the two lines are that define the Bezier curve. And this basically is what we are calling uh, the Bezier curve. Okay, now here you notice that there's a challenge. If this is the way you are defining your curves, is a small challenge. And you can actually be able to see my challenge. I don't know who can be able to notice the challenge I'm having in producing curves using this method. So there's a way I'm limited based on the vertices that I'm using. I'm just using three vertices, okay? Three points and an angle. And there's a limitation to how far I can be able or to what extent I can be able to vary my curve. That's a disadvantage of these uh, Bezier curves. Due to the way the curve is defined, using a set of vertices in a certain order with your tangent, there's a limitation to how complex your curves can be. And that's what gives rise to another method of generating curves, which is called the B-spline curves. And somebody tell me you don't see something similar between the B-spline curves and the Bezier curves. I pause there for effect. Tell me you don't see the relationship between the Bezier curve and the B-spline curves.
All right, should be fairly straightforward. When you look at the Bezier curve, we are using just a set of three points in your tangent to define a curve. When it comes to the baseline curve method, we are using more points. So you notice we have more points, more angles to be able to create far much more complex curves. So unlike the previous curve, where I could only change it in a certain limited way, baseline curves are defined using a set of control points. So instead of being limited to just three control points, like the Bezier curve, here I have a set, I have a number of control points. And each set of points uh, will connect with the next one at a certain angle. And so by using this method, I can actually, I end up with multiple control points, which give me more flexibility. I can be able to come up with far much more complex curves using this baseline method. And again, of course, if you wanna read a bit more into details about the way uh, those functions work, let me try and point out for you in the book. Uh, so here, spline representations. So if you want to read about Bezier curves, uh, B-spline curves and so on, a little bit more into the details, just go back to this textbook again. And in this topic, you should be able to find a bit more information. Of course, uh, the tutorials, again, give it to you in a summarized, simplified form, but it's more or less the same thing. Now, we can sum up all the different methods of producing curves by just saying the differences between them you should notice very easily is, the function that you use to produce the curve, the kind of flexibility that you have with respect to how complex can you make the curves. So for example, even PowerPoint has taken advantage of that. So you can think of this as being the Bezier curve, how much easier to, to produce, but is uh, limited. So if you go to, again, the insert menu, you'll see they've defined another different kind of curve. Uh, so let's try this one. You can see I have multiple points. So this is the kind of curve we are calling a baseline curve. And once I've defined my curve, I can be able to make some changes to my curve. Although here I'm not able to directly access the, uh, the points. Actually, one other thing I wanted to uh, show you guys as we conclude is if you look at any graphics application, like PowerPoint is a very good explanation. We have talked so much about things like transformations. Right now we are talking about curves and so on and how to generate them and how to implement them. Bottom line, when you are looking at a, a, an application like a PowerPoint, it has already done all that behind the scenes. And I just wanted to show you an example. Uh, so, for example, if this is our graphic, so this is the graphic that we are playing around with. Maybe let's do a slightly better graphic uh, than this one. Just give me one second. So let's just try to do a slightly more complex graphic so that we can just show you how straightforward everything we have been talking about is. So I can start here creating a funky uh, baseline curve, then I just join like that. And so I've created some baseline curves, joined them and I have some field area. So just notice what happens when I right click this and go to format shape. Now look at some of the options that I have here. If I come to, if I come to, uh, here, if I come here, you notice already, I can do reflection. Now, what did we say about reflection? This is an example of a transformation. So I can actually be able to do a reflection of this graphic right here. How? Uh, so I can simply do something like that. So you notice we explained what a reflection is we came up with a matrix that is used to do a reflection and how that will be implemented. And you can see here already, this is implemented in simple graphics packages like 
like a PowerPoint. I can do a reflection. What other transformations can I be able to do? Can you guys be able to see the size? So I can do some scaling. I thought I would show you down here. Can you guys see this 3D rotation? So if you remember when we were talking about transformations, we talked about rotation as being one of the transformations you can apply to uh, a graphic. And here you can see already this is implemented. So I can rotate this. So you remember uh, when it comes to 2D graphics, we said rotation only occurs on the X and Y axis. But if you are doing 3D graphics, there is rotation on the Z axis as well. So you can see there's a Z rotation. So I can rotate on the X axis here, simply by clicking on this. And you can see my graphic is rotating. I can rotate on the Y axis like that. And I can rotate on the Z axis like that. And this is basically the kind of thing that we have been trying to talk about. So what you are trying to, what we are trying to understand is how does the computer produce these kind of transformations? How does the computer produce these kinds of graphics from a program? Okay. And the bottom line we have been trying to underline here is we're trying to understand this slightly deeper than a lay person because we are computer science and uh, BBIT students. So I think uh, when I look at my time, we have exhausted our, exhausted our one hour, but I hope I have helped you to understand better the last two topics uh, on curves and surfaces. And I pointed you out to readings that you can do uh, if you want to dig deeper, so that next week when we meet, we talk briefly about image processing, which will be our last topic. So unless you guys have some questions or reactions, as usual, we try to keep this uh, within one hour so that it does not uh, become too long and boring. So unless you guys have questions, we can leave that there. So remember that on Thursday at 7 p.m. we will do our final cut. And we'll do that one using the Responders Lockdown Browser. So make sure you have a computer and you've installed that Responders uh, Lockdown Browser. Between 7 and 8 p.m. On Thursday, we will do that cut. Okay, so feel free to ask me any other questions tomorrow when we'll be doing some revision. Uh, I was also thinking that I hope by next week, you guys will have submitted all the assignments. One of the things you notice I've been trying to avoid doing is I've been trying to avoid doing the actual uh, demonstrations of the code because that will be like giving you the answers to some of the assignments. So because next week I assume we'll have done everything, I can do for you some demos of how to do some of those graphics transformations. So again, as usual, just to check that we are together, I want everybody to type in the chat no to mean they have no question so that we can stop there. Somebody is asking about extensions. I will let you know about that. Please, everybody, just kindly do the honors. Just type no to mean you have no question and to also indicate that you have been with us. Of course, the recording will be uploaded in the next one hour. If you want to go back and check, you can go back and check and read a bit more about this. Okay, we'll assume everybody is with us and you have no questions. So thank you guys for showing up today. We will stop there and we will look about those extensions for the submissions.